Welcome to Fort Worth, Texas. Welcome to the world's largest conference for podcasters by podcasters. Welcome to Podcast Movement 2015. Let's get a clap, let's get a clap. Oh yeah, that's enough, I'm done, I'm done. We're not here to dance. We're podcasters. We just talk. We just talk. Now, you know, it's like, that's one of the things I love being on this kind of stage. You know, it's like when you're up here and everybody's watching you, you could do whatever you want. And it's really cool because an audience can easily see the kind of person you are and what, you, what you're all about and what your personality is like when you're on a stage like this. You know, and you've already seen a little bit of me. You know, I, I like to beatbox, and I incorporate that into my episodes and stuff. You can see that, you know, I'm pretty short. Uh, that's why I wear these vests, because they make me look taller. Although I do want to dispute that fact, because I came back to the hotel room last night after the awards, and again, humbled and honored and just so blessed for that <laughs> podcast award last night. Thank you. But I got back to the hotel room, and then I saw this picture on Facebook from Darren. <laughs> is, is Darren in the house? Where's Darren at? Back there. And you know, he, he says, bumped into this guy. And that's cool. I really, I remember taking this picture yesterday. But then I started reading some of the comments. <laughs> so here's one from Faye that says, oh boy, hope you didn't hurt him being so teeny weeny compared to you. <laughs> And, and I am wearing a vest in this, by the way. Uh, and then Dwayne said, put him in your pocket and bring him home now. And then he said, looks more like a father-son picture. Now enjoy your first day of kindergarten, Pat. Remember, daddy will pick you up. Uh. And then Brian follow, followed up with po pocket caster. <laughs> and then Sharon said, yes, probably literally didn't see him. I'm right there. And then Dwayne said, the pocket pack, keep him in your pocket. And when you need business advice, he is right there. I can hear the infomercial now. <laughs> it's OK, Darren, you're all good. Because you came back and said, Pat, I didn't say it. It's not me. <laughs> so it's not you. It's your friends. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You know, I, I love to poke fun at myself all the time. You know, I always do that on my show. I feel like it's a great way to be honest and transparent and vulnerable. It's kind of how I dealt with getting picked on when I was little. Why did I get picked on? Well, because I was short. <laughs> you know, that's a little bit of who I am. And you know, I love to have fun too. Now, when you're watching somebody on stage like this, it's very easy for you to understand who that person is, right? But that's also what I love about podcasts. With a podcast, each and every one of you who has a podcast, you have your own stage, right? 
And with the power of your voice, your true self and personality can shine through. It's very easy for somebody to connect with you over a podcast. And actually, I feel like the podcasting stage is way better than this kind of stage up here. Honestly, for several reasons. One, you don't have to travel to go and speak to your people. Unless, of course, you're a travel podcaster, then yes, you'd have to travel or else you'd have nothing to talk about. But you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to fly to speak to your people in order to speak to people. You don't have to trudge through 100 degree weather to talk to a crowd. Unless you live here in Texas, in which case, you know, good luck. I don't, I don't know how you do it. Like, I went outside yesterday. I started to melt. I'm a spoiled San Diegan. It's 75 all year. So, you know, that's that. <laughs> And you know, another reason why the podcasting stage is much better than this stage is because, think about it, your listeners can listen to you at any time, from anywhere, while doing anything. I mean, there, there, there's no packing and travel and hotel, there's no prep time, there's, heck, there's not even a price point. I mean, the only people watching me live right now are you guys, those of you at home watching on the virtual ticket, and, and those of you watching illegally on Periscope right now. <laughs> Yeah, I said it, illegally. I actually don't know what the policy is. You'll have to take that up with Dan and Jared. Uh, but if you are watching me on Periscope right now, um, hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> At Pat Flynn, yeah, tap away. Leave those hearts. As Chris Ducker would say, go track and field on these things. <laughs> now, the third and final reason why I love the podcasting stage better than this stage is because as soon as I'm done here, like, I'm, I'm done. Right? I mean, there may be a recording and it may be viewed later by a few people, but your podcast is meant to be viewed and consumed later. And not just later, like tomorrow or next week later, but sometimes years later. And it's there almost like as if it's an evergreen presentation. Every time you come out with an episode, it's like you're building your library of presentations forever there to bring people in to your tribe, to connect with people, to build a relationship with them, to inspire, to educate, to entertain them. And that's why I love podcasting so much. And why I feel like, you know, I get a lot of biz uh, people ask me for business advice now. And, you know, the number one, one of the number one questions is, well, if you had to start it from, from scratch and you wanted to build a core audience of raving fans, what platform would you use? Would you blog? Would you podcast? Would you do videos? By far, podcast. Absolutely. Now, I've been podcasting for a number of years. How many of you actually listen to the Smart Passive Income podcast? Raise your hand. Wow. Thank you. Love you. How many of you don't listen to the Smart Passive Income podcast? That's all right. I still love you, too. Uh, what about my other shows? How about, how about Ask Pat? How many of you listen to Ask Pat? That's awesome. How many of you watch SPI TV? It's a video podcast. They do exist, people. Obviously, not as big as audio podcasts. And how many of you listen to Food Trucker School? Like two people. <laughs> and that's OK. You know, I expected that, because that's reflected in the download numbers. And the download numbers aren't incredibly impressive. You know, some of my episodes of Smart Passive Income get up to 300, 350,000 downloads per episode. Uh, Food Trucker, after six weeks, about 800 to 1,000. So it's, it's not that much. I know a lot of you who've recently started have way more than that. But then I look around this room. And there's about 1,000 people in this room. So it's as if every time I come out with an episode of Food Trucker, it's as if I'm up on stage speaking to this many people. I mean, it puts this whole podcasting thing into perspective, right? Can you imagine, like just right now, imagine a room full of all of your listeners and what that would be like. It's insane. Some of you are speaking in front of a stadium full of people every single day. And the thing is, you're all worldwide speakers. Your audience is worldwide. Everybody who has a podcast is a worldwide speaker. Right now, I'm just a Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, Omna Hotel, Texas Ballroom F speaker. That F part makes it sound really bad. I'm an F speaker. Let's do a little survey. How many of you, raise your hand if you have a podcast? Keep your hand up if you have more than one episode, or more than one show. Wow, not too many hands went down, so thank you. A lot of us get obsessed with this podcasting thing, right? Yeah, I have four, I have four shows, so. Uh, how many of you are here to serve the podcasting audience in some way, like a service or a, a software or things like that? Yeah, let's give it up for these people. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, you guys are what enable us to do what we do as podcasters. And some of you have been around for over a decade. I mean, Todd Cochran and Rob over from Libsyn, all guys I have madly respect for what you do and what you've done. So thank you guys so much for what you do. How many of you don't have a podcast up yet? Raise your hand. Now keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. That's a good chunk of people here. And everybody else, look around at the people with their hand up. <laughs> Let's help them out. <laughs> okay? You know, I, I, I remember what it was like when I first started. I was scared as hell. And I know some of you are too. So let's help them out, give them advice, you know, be there for them. How many of you don't even know what a podcast is? <laughs> like like you, you were melting outside and you saw people and you were like, ooh. I like people. Nobody? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so we're going to learn a lot this weekend. I'm incredibly excited to be here. We're going to meet a lot of amazing people. We're going to make a lot of great connections that we can bring home with, the, home with us as well. We're going to party it up too, I'm sure. Some of you have already done that. And a lot of you, not a lot of you, but maybe some of you are maybe going to drink a little too much. Uh, and just as a reminder, you know, we'll go home and talk about it on our podcast. So just be, <laughs> just be careful. That's all I'm saying. You know, it's like at least we all have audio podcasts, or most of us do, so you know, the visuals are left out. But some of us do have video podcasts, so if you see me with a camera, just behave yourself, okay? Now, I wanted to take this time on stage here. You know, I'm so blessed to be here. I wanted to take about 30 minutes with you, and I want to stress that 30 part, because I know we're all tired of being stuck at 20. Thanks, iTunes. We appreciate that. <laughs> So 30 minutes to kind of talk about something I really wanted to talk about, something I've been thinking about ever since I've been in, invited to speak on stage here. And, and it kind of, it, it brings me back to 2008, or 2000, 2009, sorry. Um, excuse me, hold on. Ah, it's really hot in Texas. Um, uh, Pat, what are you doing? Uh, hello? Pat, what are you doing? You are the keynote speaker and you are dropping the ball. Um, excuse me, can you not interrupt my presentation, please? Oh, excuse me, can you not interrupt my presentation? But golly, Pat, did you put that music bit in there to hide how terrible your presentation was going to be? Jeez, what? Can, guys, can, can the mic guys in the back cut off that mic, please? You can't get rid of me, Pat. I've hacked into your presentation, and it's just you and me. And honestly, I'll keep going because somebody has got to fill that dead air you wafted into the building. Oh my God! Uh, can you just listen to me, please? You were. This is ridiculous. I would rather listen to a five-year-old episode of one of the bottom 100 podcasts on iTunes recorded in an echo chamber on a plastic desktop microphone on a Gateway 486 DX2 computer using a voice recorder in Windows 3.1 at half speed backwards on my iPhone 3 with earbuds that don't even fit. Then listen to any more of your BS. Uh, I don't know where you are, but you know, if you were a real man, you would come up here to the stage right now and face me. Or maybe you're in the back of the room, I can't see you, but can you raise your hand, please? Whoever's saying that? Hand is raised, Pat. Really? Where, where are you? Here, let me help you out. Hello, McFlynn! Anybody home? Serious? What's going on here? I'm in your head, Pat. Uh, yeah, so stop interrupting me so I can get back to the presentation, please. No, Pat. I mean, I'm in your head. I'm the voice in your head. Wait, and you have a British accent? <laughs> well, for now, but perhaps you'd prefer one man, one stage. Pat Flynn in the critically acclaimed number one disaster movie of the year, your keynote presentation. 
Ha ha ha, very funny. No, let's not do the movie guy voice, please. You are literally screwing this entire thing up. No, no, wait. Was that Chris Ducker? You Pat Flynn, oh boy, Pat Flynn, look at you, strut your way up to the stage. Sit down, little girly man, your presentation's going to blow. Can you, can you please just let me finish my keynote? <laughs> keynote? More like key nope. <laughs> oh dear me. All right, fine. I'll let you start again. No interruptions. No interruptions? No interruptions, I promise. Thank you. Sorry. Gets in the way sometimes. Don't so screw up. <laughs> so as I was saying... You got this, Pat. <laughs> no pressure. I thought you said you weren't going to interrupt me. I thought you said you practiced. I mean your head, Pat. No pressure. You got this, Pat. No. You are literally <laughs> screwing this entire thing up. <gasps> Pat, I'm still here, Pat. I will always be here. And scene. <laughs> you know, if somebody were to talk to you like that in real life, to interrupt you like that, embarrass you, how would you feel about that person? If you were really struggling and you just needed a boost of confidence or a little bit of encouragement, yet instead somebody just tore you down and kicked you while you were down, how, how, what would you feel about that person? Right? It'd be very easy just to say, you know what, what are you doing here? Get out of my life. Like, what the heck? You're in my way. I'm trying to do something important here. Yet, for whatever reason, we all love to keep this one hater with us in our lives. This one hater who, who loves to steer our ship in a direction opposite the direction we were going, right? This one hater who, at the moment when we're so close to that breakthrough or achievement, it just pulls us back away from it, back to right to where we were. The most destructive hater of them all, ourselves. And the truth is, we are our own worst hater. It's true. And it doesn't even matter what part of life you're in. It doesn't matter if you're just getting started with something or maybe you've been doing it for a while. Whenever you're trying to achieve that next level, those, those doubts, those excuses start coming in, right? That voice. I don't think I could do it. I'm not good enough. I've, they're not going to like it. And it's dangerous. I mean, imagine all the amazing things we could have accomplished if we didn't let our voice get in the way. I mean, it, it happens the moment we conceive the idea of starting a podcast. I know a lot of us, including myself, have felt that. When the first time you click that record button, right? Oh, man, it's not good enough. It's, they're not going to like it. Or the first time you ask somebody to come on your show and how nervous you are before that. Or, or the first time you publish an episode. That voice can be destructive. How many of you have ever heard that voice in your head before? A lot of you, thank you. How many of you are hearing that voice fairly recently? with certain things that you need to do. Thank you for being honest about that. And the reason I'm talking about all this today is because, you know, I wanted to take time on stage to entertain you and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, I wanted to start the show by challenging you. I want to challenge you. All of you, those of you who don't have a podcast yet, those of you who already have a podcast, those of you who are servicing the podcasting industry in some way. And the reason for this challenge is because I love podcasting so much. Podcasting has changed my life. And we're at a point with podcasting where I feel like it's growing so big now, which is great, but a lot of things are starting to look the same. And a lot of things have been the same for a while, for years sometimes. But I think there's a lot of room for improvement in the future. So my challenge to you is when you go to the next sessions, when you go home, I want you to really think about how you could innovate. I want you to think big, 
and I want you to reach higher. Now it's hard though, because when you do these things, when you innovate, then you get worried about perfection and what people will say. When you think bigger, you get more resistance pushing you back. And when you reach further, we only reach as far as we think we can reach. And there's a good example of this. There's a little experiment that was done in the past where you take a flea, and you know how a flea can jump really high. You put it in a glass cylinder, and it's jumping as high as it can. And then you take a ceiling, and then you put it all the way down really close to the bottom. So it's maybe just a couple inches, and that flea can only jump that high. And it keeps hitting its head doop, 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 on the ceiling. Well, eventually it gets to that point where you take off that ceiling, and it won't ever jump higher than those two inches. Because it's conditioned at that point to not realize its potential. The same thing when they train baby elephants or train elephants, which is sad, but the way they do it is they actually stake and chain them to the ground when they're born, and it's, it's you know, too hard for them to come out. So eventually there's so much pain and they're trying to get out and then they stop because it's too painful. But then what happens? The elephant grows up and it becomes huge. It becomes powerful. It can easily break through, th break through that shackle. But it doesn't even try because it is conditioned to think that, we, that it can't break free. I want you all to try something really quick. Can you please raise your hand as high as you can, everybody? Now raise your hand two inches higher. Thank you. <laughs> so you don't even know how far you can go. And I know that's like a stupid, fun, silly game, and it's a good thing to do with your kids and things like that. I remember my band director, because I'm a huge marching band nerd, my band director in high school did that for us, and I was blown away. And I was like, wow, maybe I'm not putting as much as I can into the things I'm trying to do. And so that was a really cool experiment, and it just shows you that you know, your limits might not be limits, actually. It's like the four-minute mile. Everybody thought it was impossible until somebody broke it, and then everybody started breaking it, right? So I want to share something with you that is quite embarrassing when a moment in my life when that voice got in the way from me doing something I really wanted to do. Back in 2008, I made the decision to start a podcast. And I was so excited because a podcast had changed my life at that point, and I wanted to change other people's lives through my voice and the podcasting platform and medium. So I had a small little black at the, a blog at that time, and like all podcasters do when we get the idea to start a podcast, I bought all this equipment, and then I tested it out. And then I played an audio file. The very first audio file I've ever published online was published on my blog in 2008. Here it is. Hey, everybody. This is Pat from the Smart Passive Income blog. Uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to this. I think that's so awesome that uh, you, know, you guys are helping me out figure out all this new podcasting stuff. I'm actually... I just bought a whole bunch of podcasting equipment for myself because, um, I mean, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so I figured, hey, why not do one? So, I mean, really, I, I really don't know what I'm going to talk about yet, so I just wanted to get familiar with all the equipment that I have right now and uh, what it's like to post something online and hear what people think about it. So, I mean, you tell me, should I give up on podcasting now because my voice sucks so bad or, you know, should I talk a little deeper or, I don't I really have no idea, so... Again, just thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. Keep coming back to the website. I got tons of information coming up in the near future. And uh, let's make 2009 a great year for all of us. Let's make it, let's make it the most profitable year we've ever had. Um, and you know, I'll try my best to help you get there. So again, good luck with everything. Happy holidays. And this is Pat Flynn from the Smart Passive Income blog signing off. Peace. No, that's kind of, that's disgusting. I mean, that's embarrassing for a number of reasons. One, I don't know what the deal was with the music selection there. It's not me at all. Um, secondly, I mean, you could hear it in my voice, just the lack of confidence, right? And I think a lot of us could relate to that. But I just didn't believe in what I was doing. But I, I was trying it out. But number three, the, and the worst part of it all, is you know this was published in late 2008 on my blog. My very first episode came out July 2010. A year and a half later. <laughs> now, why did it take me so long? No, it didn't take me a year and a half to figure out how to set up an RSS feed. That was like a year and a quarter, but no, I'm just kidding. No, really, though, it took me a year and a half to get over myself. 
you know, and stop listening to those excuses. Oh, Pat, nobody's going to love it. You know, why don't you just go back to doing something you're good at, like blogging? Nobody's going to let, your voice is terrible. Nobody's going to enjoy your content. What are you even going to talk about? How are you going to keep it up? Sounds like a personal problem, but. <laughs> but you know, those things got in the way. And then I discovered this book by Stephen Pressfield. How many of you have read this book called The War of Art? Thank you. Required reading for all creative types. Yes, that does include us podcasters, right? And so Stephen Pressfield talks about you know, how we live in our comfort zone, right? And this, this is where we love to be. This is the things we normally do. But all the magic, all the innovation, the stuff I'm trying to get you to do happens way over here, outside of our comfort zone, right? But then comes that little voice, and he kind of gives it a, ni a nice term called the resistance. So this resistance comes and blocks us from reaching that magic and brings us back to where we were. And I love how he describes it in this book. I highly recommend you read this book if you haven't already. So here's Stephen Pressfield talking a little bit about where this resistance comes from. To me, I, I consider it's all self-generated. I don't think it comes from out there. But it's that uh, anytime we're trying to access a, a higher part of ourselves, this shadow element enters the picture, like an equal and opposite force to the force of creation. Like, uh, our, I, another al analogy I use is like if, if a tree, we have a tree, and that's our dream, our novel, or whatever creative thing, that tree casts a shadow. And as soon as that tree goes up, the shadow appears. And that shadow is self-sabotage, procrastination, stubbornness, you know, um, arrogance, fear, fear of failure, fear of success, all, all of those things. And I love the way he describes that. And he, he begins to describe that this resistance, this voice, is, it lives in everybody. And it's just a matter of how well can we manage this voice and put it aside and not listen to it, because that's not us. And I almost feel like it's kind of a test, you know, to see if you really want whatever it is you're trying for. But there is good news here. There, there is actually very good news. Fear is good. Fear is good because, like self-doubt, fear is an indicator Fear tells us what we have to do. The more scared we are of a work or calling, the more we know that we actually have to do that. I mean, think of the most amazing things that have happened in your life up to this point. Maybe a graduation or you know, a job that you have that you were really fighting for, getting married or, 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 or having a child. Oh my gosh, starting a business, starting a podcast. All the most amazing things that have happened have always been preceded by that fear. So if we look at that fear and instead say, you know what, that's a sign. Because on the other side of that fear is something amazing. So I encourage you, as you move forward, to consider fear an indicator that that's actually what you should be doing. And that's what I do now. That's why I speak on stage. I was deathly afraid of speaking on stage back in 2011 until Philip Taylor invited me to FinCon. Then the closing keynote dropped out and he put me in the, in the end for my very first presentation. And I was scared, literally almost throwing up. But you know what? I knew, based on my past, with podcasting, videos, and all those other things, that this is something I had to do. And it meant that I cared about it. So I did it. And it wasn't perfect, but I got through it. So I encourage you to see if you can answer this question, not just now, but into the future. And you can pass this question along to other people as well. What's on the other end of your fear? What is that fear actually telling you what you should do? There's a quote I live by that I want to share with you that really pushes me forward in the, in, in the face of fear. And that is, I would rather live a life full of oh wells than a life full of what ifs. Those what ifs will haunt you. <laughs> But if you didn't know well, well, at least you gave it a shot. And now you know. So take that with you moving forward. Now to finish up here, I want to talk about the seven ways you can defeat resistance. Seven ways you can defeat resistance. And the first thing I want to talk about is just simply pulling the trigger. Pull the trigger. Just go. An object at rest stays at rest. An object in motion continues and stays in motion. And I found that one of the hardest things to do with anything is just start, right? And just go. 
from writing a blog post to recording podcast episodes to writing in, in the morning in my, with my book, once I get going, then I'm in motion. And I want to give a big shout out to Zephan over here. Is Zephan in the crowd? Where's Zephan at? Awesome. So Zephan came up to me yesterday after the awards, uh, awards show, and he told me that uh, um, we had exchanged emails in 2013. I went back to, to my hotel room and I read what he had wrote to his fans, and I want to read that for you here. So he said, when I left my job, one of the first people I messaged was Pat Flynn. I'd been following him for years. In May of 2013, he wrote to me and said, a lot of people go into something and stick with it only to realize it's not what they should have done in the first place. For me, it took getting laid off to realize that, that that's me talking, a huge blessing in disguise. For you, you discover that early on your own. And although things are scary, exciting, ecstatic, and confusing all at the same time right now, your older self will look back on this time of your life and thank you for it. And then he followed up with, well, I'm older now, and looking back, I don't regret it one bit. I got to thank him in person, and I'm grateful. So. Thank you, Zephan, for pulling the trigger and sharing that with me. That means the world. Thank you. Great job on pulling the trigger. And you never know what's going to be on the other end, but at least he gave it a shot. And now he's doing something incredible. What shows are you working on now with your video production crew? Did you say House of Cards? House of Cards. I've been in the White House. He's been in the White House. Uh, NFL, NHL. NFL, NHL. He's worked on House of Cards as a result of him starting his own work. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, let's talk about doing one thing at a time. How many of you feel like you're doing a hundred things at a time, right? Most of us, thank you. You know, my son, he, I love him to death, but it's like whenever we're late for something and we tell him to hurry up, he tries to do all those things at the same time. Like, he'll be putting his underwear on and his shirt on at the same time, and he's like, because we tell him to hurry up and go, and he thinks that it's faster to go faster. But it's faster, obviously, when you go one thing at a time. Yet. We kind of forget that when we grow older, when we have so many things going on. And the thing I tell him is, you know what? How do you put your socks on? Do you put both socks on at the same time? He goes, ha, daddy, no, that's silly. And I'm like, okay, well, you put your socks on one at a time. Why don't you do everything else one at a time so you can focus on it, get it done, and then move on to the next thing. And I think a lot of us can benefit from that strategy as well. There's another great book out there called The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Popson. And they talk about this thing called the domino effect. And that is, if you focus on that next task on your list, and just that task, this domino effect starts to happen with all the other things that you have to do. And the interesting thing about dominoes is, you know, you just tap that front one, and they, all, they go all the way around. I think there was a world record set recently with nine million dominoes. Imagine all those jewels of energy just from that tap in the beginning. But the really cool example they use in the book is a domino can knock over a domino that's one and a half times its size. So if you start with a two inch domino, by the time you get to the 73rd domino, increasing exponentially, that domino will reach from the earth to the moon. And just that one little tap of that two inch domino can knock over that domino that's, that reaches up to the moon. Obviously that would kill a massive load of people and we don't want that to happen. <laughs> so that's just how, like, you know, just think about, think about that. <laughs> so work on one thing at a time. What's your next task? Focus on that. And there's this thing that I learned from Jeremy Franson from the Internet Business Mastery Podcast called Just In Time Learning. This has saved my life and I want to pass it along to you. And that is instead of consuming all content from every word about everything, consume content that is only related to your very next task. Just In Time Learning. Now that doesn't mean you should ignore everything else, it means you should just put those things aside. So what happens is, for example, when I get an article in my feed or on Twitter and I see it's popular, it's about Pinterest. I'm not into Pinterest right now. I may be in the future, but I know that I shouldn't look at that right now. And you know, we all have that bright light syndrome, we're going here, we're going there. I put it in an Evernote folder for later. And I have about 20 Pinterest articles that are apparently really, real good. And when it's time to go to Pinterest, then I have that collection already there for me. I don't have to go searching for it. So just in time learning has been a big help for me. Don't worry about the failure. <laughs> and a lot of you know my favorite movie is Back to the Future. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't bring a DeLorean with us today like I did in Vegas. But um, this is one of my favorite scenes. This is scene 12. I know that. From Back to the Future, it's called and titled The Matchmaker. And this is when young Marty McFly is trying to hook up his dad with his mom again because things went haywire when he went back at the time. Well, he sees his dad in the cafeteria writing. And he's never seen his dad do anything creative before. 
back in, in, in real time. So he goes up to his dad and he goes, what, what are you writing? And then George goes, stories, science fiction stories about creatures coming to Earth from other planets. And then Marty goes, get out of town. I didn't know you did anything creative. Let me read some. And George goes, no, 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 no. I don't let anybody read my stories. Well, why not? Well, because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of what they're going to say. What if they don't like it? I don't think I could handle that kind of failure and rejection. And of course, the movie progresses and things happen. And at the end, he actually has a book because of all the changes that he's made. He's become more confident in the new 1985. Well, there's a lot of good examples we could take from this, uh, this whole idea of rejection and failure. I feel like it's a necessary process. As a podcaster, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, whatever, if you're trying to deliver a message, failure is required. And it's weird because we are conditioned to think that failure is bad. F. Oh, man, I failed. No, you just didn't get it yet. So continue moving forward. Now you know what not to do. I actually love to fail. I don't try to fail, but I love it because then I'm like, OK, that didn't work. Let's try this new way. So here's some examples of other famous rejections or failures. So Tim Ferriss in the book The 4-Hour Workweek was rejected 26 times by different publishers before it became a New York Times bestseller. Harry Potter by J.K. Rowling. Somebody tweeted at her the other day and said, how many no's do you get before you finally got published? And she said, loads. First publisher to turn down Harry also sent R. Galbraith his rudest rejection. That's Robert Galbraith, her pen name for another series of books. They don't even want me in a beard. <laughs> Angry Birds, a lot of us know this game. Well, this company, this is their 52nd game. A lot of us don't realize that they made 51 games before that. And then Back to the Future. Rejected over 40 times by major motion picture studios. 40 times. What if on the 40th time, Robert Zemeckis was like, you know what, 40, that's enough, we're done. I don't know what I would do with my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> Quite honestly. So expect failure, enjoy failure, learn from failure. True failure is getting that first roadblock and then giving up and turning back around. Consistency. I think we all know how important consistency is for a podcaster. Our audience expects us to publish on a certain date, but also just consistency of our hard work. You know, it's the, this, this idea of going pro. That's what Stephen Pressfield talks about in terms of conquering this voice in our head. It's, it's going pro. You know, the difference between amateur and pro. And, you know, an amateur will, when they're, maybe when they're hurt, they'll sit out. But a pro will always be there and work hard and continue with his work and his passion. Next, associate with the right people. This is FDR and his brain trust back in the 1930s. And in order for him to get America out of the Great Depression, he connected with a lot of smart people, people that knew things that he didn't. And he coined this group, brain trusts. So this is very famous. This is in all the history books and all that stuff. And uh, you know, I remember reading it in, in college and stuff. Um, there's another famous example of sort of this collection of people who you can associate yourself with to encourage you, sort of like an alliance, if you will, to achieve a greater goal between all of you. Um, Andrew Carnegie revolutionized the steel industry in the 19th century. And he was interviewed by Napoleon Hill. And Napoleon Hill asked him, well, how did you become the richest man in the world? How did you become so smart with, with the steel industry? And Napoleon Hill asked him, and this is what Andrew Carnegie said. He said, we have here in this business a mastermind. It is not my mind. It is not the mind of any other man on my staff, but the sum total of all these minds. So he actually credits the success of his business to the other people he connected with. And they didn't always get along. But he knew that the power of the whole was greater than the single. Then he went on to become one of the most richest men in the world. When he died, he became the um, most philanthropic person. He's donated the most money at that time in his life. So at the time, he had donated $375 million by the time of his death. Again, this is 19th century. If you equate that to today's dollar, that's $4.76 billion. And he credits that a lot to the people he's associated himself with. You know, I'm, I'm in three different mastermind groups. This is one right here. You'll see Mark Mason, Michael Stelzner, myself, Ray Edwards, Cliff Ravenscraft, and Leslie Samuel over there. We meet every single Wednesday. We hold each other accountable. We know about our businesses. And we are brutally honest with each other. And that's the most important thing. And we're friends. I mean, we take care of each other. But we're also, like I said, brutally honest because we all want each other to succeed. And this has been going for 
I don't know, a year and a half, two years now, and it's been amazing. And I'm so blessed to be with you guys. And I know a lot of you have groups that you associate yourself with too. Maybe it's on a regular basis, maybe not, but it's so beneficial to what you and what you're trying to achieve. Next, systematize. This is great because it takes the decision making out of that process. When you have things that you know you do over and over and over again, write those things down so you know that those are the things you're supposed to do. You don't have to go and fumble around and think because when you give yourself time to think, you begin to hear that voice, you begin to distract yourself and all those sorts of things. It's like uh, th there's this networking rule that if there's somebody that you want to walk up to, and you can use this here, if there's somebody that you want to speak to and talk to, give yourself no more than three seconds to go up to that person and introduce yourself. Why three seconds? Because that's not enough time for your brain to stop you <laughs> from going over there, right? And the thing is, we wake up in the morning with a tank of decision-making juice, if you will. And over the course of the day, when you make decisions, the harder decisions use up more fuel. And then by the end of the day, that's why at the end of the day, it's really tough to make decisions. That's why they say nothing good happens after 2 AM, I think. <laughs> but you've depleted your decision-making juice. And so save that. So all these things that you know you're going to do over and over and over again, systematize them, automate task lists, and then you can get to a point where maybe you outsource this stuff so you don't even have to think about it at all. It just gets done. Now the last, the last part of this is transform. And side note, if any of you see the Easter egg I put in there in this presentation, let me know later. So transform. Now when you start a podcast, you yourself will transform. For those of you who have been podcasting for a while, or even a short time, you've probably noticed that you know, it's a lot of fun and you get, you get to transform. I know that I've transformed in, in terms of being a better communicator. I feel like I'm more confident as well, being behind the microphone. It also transformed me into a speaker. I would have never gotten on stage if it wasn't for the training that podcasting gave me to speak on stage. But in addition to self-transformation, you know, it transforms those around you as well. Those immediately around you, actually, and those on the other side of the world. And it's really interesting because my, my son, you know, he's five years old, and he, he kind of knows what daddy's up to now. And he sees me in my office. And one time, you know, it was nap time, so I had an opportunity to record a podcast. So I, I usually do that during nap time. And then all of a sudden, I'm recording, I'm doing the Skype interview, and the door creaks open. And I see these little fingers pop through the door. I'm like, oh man, he woke up. And he opens the door. And he goes, what are you doing, Daddy? I'm like, I'm recording a podcast, sit down. Right? A lot of you. <laughs> She's like, right? <laughs> I love that. And so he sits down. And he's a crazy kid. He'll usually go all over the place and do this and do that. Like, he's insane. But he sat there for 30 minutes and watched me talking to this person and recording on this microphone. And after I was done, I said, I'm sorry, bud. Uh, you woke up early from your nap. I was recording a podcast. And I was like, he was like, oh, well, what's a podcast? And I said, well, I could show you. We can, we can record something. Why don't, why don't I record us? You know, I can ask you questions. And we could record that and play it back later and listen to it. And he, he got so, yes, let's do it. Uh, can, can we videotape it? Can we videotape it? And then I was like, you know what? You know, video podcasts, they don't have enough pull. They don't have enough pull. <laughs> they don't get the SEO like you would on YouTube. So I don't know if video podcasts would be the, wait, you're five years old. <laughs> yeah, let's record it. So let me play the recording for you. Johnny. What's your last name? Mm, I don't remember. Um, Flint? Yes. Flint. And what do you do all day? Just play. What do you play with? Toys. What kind of toys? What's mm. your favorite toys? What's your favorite toy? Mm, my pirate gun. Your pirate gun? Yeah. Why is that your favorite? Because, because I, I just love a, pi a pirate blasters. Oh, yeah? Mm hmm What was Daddy doing just a second ago? Mm, I get a podcast. Making a podcast? Do you know what a podcast is? No. You don't? No. What What's does it? Daddy do to make a podcast? Mm, talk. Talk. Who am I talking to? Your friends? Yeah, my friends. Do you know how many friends I have? 64? 60, 64, yes. Wow. Wow, that's a lot of friends. Yeah. How many friends do you have? Mm, two. 
two. <laughs> so that's my son. And, and now he has a thousand and two friends, so thank you. <laughs> and it's interesting because I've seen the transformation in him as a result of me doing a podcast. Maybe you've seen the same thing around the people who are close to you as well. Maybe they're interested and maybe they've started a podcast too. Or maybe they're like, like oh, you do your thing. But it's kind of cool. You're, you're, you're not bothering me. But it's cool because now he loves to record conversations. So once or twice a week, we'll actually sit down with a Zoom H4N and just record a 10 minute conversation. And it's super cool because then I can go back into time and, and hear his progression. Um, so thank you. Now, beyond the immediate transformation around the people around you, of course, we transform our listeners on the other end of the world as well. And so there's a story I want to tell you about this man named Michael. Actually, his name is pronounced Michał, which is Poland, so uh, M-I-C-H-A-L. And he sent me this really long email, like inc one of the longest emails I've ever received. And at first I was like, ugh. <laughs> but then he said, please read this. It's important, I promise. And so I started reading this. And Michal was uh, a family man, just like me. A couple of kids, a wife, and he worked really hard. He was also into extreme sports. And one day he was snowboarding and went off a jump and landed kind of funny on his legs. So funny that, not really funny, but he broke and shattered his ankles in both of his legs. And so for a while, he was only focused on these. You could see these bolts in his legs. And he just was so depressed at this time because he couldn't, he just couldn't be there for his family. He couldn't go work or do any of this stuff. And then he said, when I was in the hospital and recovering, that's when I had time and I found your podcast, Pat. I was like, oh, that, that's cool. And then he said, I listened to every single one of your episodes. And you became my virtual mentor. And so, of course, at this point, I'm, I'm fully devoted to this email. So I'm, I'm continuing to read this. And then he says, you know, I remember listening to one of your episodes where you talked about when you, when you create goals for yourself, you, you go really high, like almost impossibly high. Because if you go way up to the stratosphere, at least if you don't get that, you've gone pretty darn high anyway. And he said, at that time, he decided with two broken legs to run a marathon, a full marathon, the Warsaw Marathon, which was coming up in like a year and a half or something. So he dedicated himself, and he said that every day he listened to the Smart Passive Income podcast on his training, on his rehabilitation, and then on his walks, which eventually became runs. And then I scroll down to the bottom of this, this email, and I see this picture of him crossing the finish line and it's incredible, like look at, look at his feet, there's plates there to make sure that they don't crumble. Um, but then I read the sign and he translated it for me and he said thank you uh, to his wife, kids, and, and then thank you Pat Flynn. I know there was somebody who cried last night. We aren't that weak. Or, no, I'm just kidding. Um, sorry. But I didn't know this was happening. Like for a year and a half, this guy was learning from me. And, and I, I had no idea. Until, like, I would have had no idea unless he sent this to me. And then the incredible thing is, you know, not only did he listen to my podcast to rehabil rehabilitate himself, but obviously he got a lot of content during that time too. And he's created a blog, a financial blog in Poland which is now one of the top blogs of all niches in Poland as well. And now he's being interviewed on shows. He has the top podcast in iTunes as well. He also is being featured in newspapers and going into these interviews. And his life has absolutely changed now. And now he's talking about the story, the fact that he tells people that I tell people his story. <laughs> and as a result of that, other people <laughs> are using his name. It just, it's absolutely mind-blowing. You know, the effect that we have just at our desk on the microphone. And so, you know, remember I was talking about that voice in our head that, that kind of creeps in there and, and, and gives us doubt? Well, there are people on the other end of the world who feel the same way. And maybe they could use your voice instead. So, 
you know, when it gets really hard for you and, and you're struggling with your podcast and you get to a point where you feel, you know, you're just not in it anymore. Remember, it's not about you. It's about who's on the other end. So don't listen to that voice. But share your voice with others and amazing things around the world can happen. Thank you guys so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. In 2016, podcast movement is hitting the road as we make our way to the Windy City. Spend some of your summer with us at the beautiful Hyatt Regency in Chicago, Illinois. Join us July 6th through the 8th as podcast movement does it bigger and better than ever. Tickets go on sale this December. We'll once again have amazing featured speakers and over 1,000 of your best podcaster friends. All that's missing is you. Register today and we'll see you in Chicago.